Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's call with LNI Secretary Jerry Oleksiak and UC Benefits Policy Director Susan Dickinson. I'm Teresa Elliott, Deputy Communications Director for LNI. You'll submit your questions by clicking the chat icon located in the lower right hand side of your screen. Please be sure to include your name and media outlet followed by your question. In the interest of time, you'll be limited to one question, but time permitting, we'll open up the call for a second round. You may submit any follow-up questions to us at dlipress at pa.gov, and we will address them after the call. For your awareness, this call is being recorded. If you do not consent to being recorded, please hang up now. Following the call, a link to the recording will be provided to the media outlets that participated today. We'll get started with comments from Secretary Jerry Oleksiak. Secretary? Thank you, Teresa, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, let me get started with some uh, number updates. Since March 15th, the start of the uh, mitigation efforts, we've paid more than $31.5 billion in unemployment benefits, uh, $6.1 billion from our regular unemployment compensation program. The remainder, the um, 26 billion or so from uh, the programs under the Federal CARES Act, from the extended benefits program of the state and federal government, and through our lost wages assistance program. Uh, since March, uh, we've also, as you know, been working uh, diligently to increase our capacity in our service center, and we've uh, almost tripled the number of our UC staff. We've gone from 775 employees to our most recently available total of 2,304. Our, those employees have worked uh, over 430, 400,000 total overtime hours since March 15th. And we have been able to uh, reach the 97% level of eligible claimants who filed for regular unemployment compensation between March 15th and October 17th. They've either been paid or were deemed not eligible for benefits. And the remaining 3%, uh, that number is decreasing, the numerical number is decreasing in that um, they're awaiting resolution and in various uh, uh, phases of adjudication. We've also, since March 15th, helped more than uh, 4 million, uh, about 4 million times that we've helped claimants uh, through our email, through our phone line, through our live chat, and through our virtual assistant. And we're expanding that capacity uh, constantly. We expect uh, by the end of this year to be 8,000 calls per day that we're able to answer and 11,000 emails we're able to answer. And we are making uh, really uh, significant progress in, in um, putting a dent in that backlog. Um, and we uh, will continue to do that uh, as long as we know there are people who still are in need of their benefits. Uh, the trust fund. Um, the balance as of Friday, November 25th was about $215 million. That's from the U.S. Treasury's uh, website. And thus far, we have borrowed about $618 million in zero interest loans. We continue, as we talk about every week, to fight the fraud battle. Uh, there are always new attempts by fraudsters to steal information or benefits from claimants. And we want to remind claimants, and again, the media has been very helpful in getting this information out. Labor and industry will never contact you and ask for personal or private information. If you receive a call, email, text, social media message, or other communication seeking information such as your username, your password, or your full social security number, please do not provide it. We won't ask for that information. We may ask for the last four digits of your social security number, but never your full number. Additionally, Al and I, uh, uh, we don't offer assistance to claimants through social media messaging due to the inability to guarantee security and confidentiality. Many states, as you know, including Pennsylvania, have been inundated with fraudulent unemployment claims, primarily through the PUA program, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program which is, uh, again, you, you're well aware of the uh, program for those traditionally not eligible for employment. Uh, to help combat that fraud, we partnered with the identity verification vendor, IDME. Thus far, uh, IDME, has, IDME has sent out well over 400,000 claimants 
uh, invitations to those claimants to have them complete the verification process. And as of last Tuesday, IDME has only been able to verify about 50,000 of those claims. So that puts our legitimate claim rate at somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. It's important to note that many of these claims were ones that were flagged by our system. For example, uh, they may have used uh, the same address several times. All new claims are now going through the IDME process, which we know will continue to de deter and catch fraud. We are still continuing to investigate pool claims that were approved prior to the implementation of IDME for fraud. We don't yet know how many are fraudulent, but we will work to identify every individual responsible with the partners that we have worked with from the beginning and hold them accountable. Uh, more information on the scams and on the fraud uh, including the warning signs and what to do if you expect you have been a victim can be found at uc.pa.gov. Um, as we uh, get closer to the end of the CARES programs, which is December 26th, um, many of us have been uh, reaching out and hoping that Congress will extend or create new programs for those people who will lose their benefits. We will are continuing to advocate for additional support uh, during this particularly difficult time. And we know, of course, that uh, numbers, uh, COVID-19 numbers are rising across the country. While Pennsylvania has recovered tremendously from its unemployment peak, two key federal unemployment programs, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program and the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program will expire at the end of December unless the federal government acts. And we know that there are thousands of Pennsylvanians who rely on those programs and the loss of those benefits will be devastating to them. And it will also be devastating to the uh, economy of Pennsylvania. The conclusion of the pandemic unemployment assistance program will be especially difficult because this program was created for workers who do not qualify for traditional unemployment compensation. And we have many claimants already asking us what they should do after December 26th. And unfortunately, right now, there is no replacement unemployment compensation program for those claimants. We will continue to advocate for replacing those programs or continuing those programs because of how important they are to our fellow citizens. Uh, we can't speculate about what future programs would look like, but we are ready to quickly and efficiently implement an extension or a new program that would provide Pennsylvania families the assistance that they really need to survive this pandemic. On a related note, uh, we'll mention again that um, anyone who may be eligible for the federal lost wages assistance program, that's an extra $300 per week, should apply. Uh, we will continue making retroactive payments for the claim weeks August 1st through September 5th for the foreseeable future as long as those grant dollars last. Uh, more information about this can be found on uc.pa.gov. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan for some information, and um, I'll have some comments at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I have some reminders, some of them seasonal reminders about what's happening with the unemployment program and, and some things that people should um, look out for, some things that maybe they uh, have to experience just because they may be experiencing a second layoff um, or continuing unemployment. So the first thing I wanna mention is the um, part-time work calculator. We do have on our website a calculator. That... <laughs> there we go, it was a little loud. Someone's not on mute, okay. Um, the uh, part-time work calculator, we do have a page on our website if you go to www.uc.pa.gov and search for part-time. Uh, there is a part-time work calculator where individuals can put in their information and we tell them exactly what they need to put in and figure out you know, how much of part-time work um, they would be able to make until they get to a level where they should not expect an unemployment benefit anymore for that week. Um, we're receiving more inquiries from claimants asking if they can work part-time or wondering why maybe they haven't received a payment for a prior week. And a lot of times it is because they're working part-time. This is a seasonal time of year where individuals might be able to 
uh, help some companies with their their Christmas needs. Um, and you know they um, are just you know making a little bit more money than they were before. So they may not realize that they might be making too much to qualify for a benefit. Um, they may work part time and potentially still receive an unemployment benefit for the week, but that is what the calculator is there to help with so that they can find out whether or not they should expect some sort of a payment. Um, the second uh, thing that I want to remind everyone about is about overpayments, which we had talked about in previous weeks. Um, we do have more staff able to uh, begin examining claims for uh, different eligibility issues and being able to then identify overpayments if they exist. Um, overpayments can occur for a variety of reasons. When we do detect them, we ask a claimant to repay the benefits either in a lump sum or it can be done through the reduction of benefits in the future. The most common issue that we're currently seeing right now is on the PUA program, and that is a misunderstanding about PUA eligibility. Unlike our other programs, PUA isn't just about not being able to find work, um, being laid off. It's very specifically for those who are um, affected by COVID, who lost their jobs due to COVID. And claimants self-certify this in the beginning, but then when we take a closer look at the claim, we may find that they actually had a different reason. They may have lost their job prior to that and simply can't find a job right now because COVID makes it difficult, but that's not one of the reasons covered in the CARES Act for being eligible for PUA. Um, so, you know, sometimes we'll find um, that they're not eligible for PUA and then we have to recover payments already made to them. So they are notified on paper and also through their dashboard if they are uh, ineligible for benefits and they have to repay them. Uh, so far for the this particular reason of not being off the COVID reason, um, we've written over 11,000 overpayments to individuals. Uh, so, you know, as we continue finding them, we'll keep uh, writing the overpayments. We always want to get individuals every penny that they're eligible for, but we're also bound by the rules and laws surrounding the program. So uh, as we find them, we do have to let individuals know that they are overpaid and that they will have money that they repay to us. Um, a third reminder is about reopening claims. Any individual who opened a claim within the past year and they find themselves out of work again, would not be filing a new claim, they would be reopening their existing claim. Unemployment claims last for one year, um, and they don't have enough benefits for a full year, but they have enough benefits between 18 to 26 weeks um, for to take an individual about half a year or so, depending on their own personal work history. So um, they can learn more by visiting www.uc.pa.gov and searching for reopen claim. And we have some tips there about reopening claims. Um, to reopen an existing claim, they can do that online as well. It'll take them through the actual questions of an initial claim. So it'll feel like a new claim kind of. Um, but on the back end, you know, an individual can only have one claim per year. So, um, you know, the website that takes them directly to reopening their claim is www.paclaims.pa.gov slash U-C-E-N. Um, and that will take them to a reopen claim. And finally, this is our traditional busy season in the winter, usually right after Thanksgiving um, and through February is, is very busy every year. Um, so in recent weeks, we've experienced an increase in call volume to our UC Service Center caused by seasonal increase, um, which is just you know natural for this time of year. This may be making it more difficult for claimants to get through, especially at certain times, we see our highest call volume on Monday morning with fewer calls coming in afternoons and later in the week. So we want to encourage emails, or I'm sorry, we want to encourage claimants to email us at uchelp.pa.gov. The average response time is about 10 days right now. It's fairly quick. Um, and we're continuing to de decrease that time every day um, as we catch up on more older emails. So, um, you know, the oldest email we have right now is from November 4th which is a little bit more of a complicated claim, but usually replies happen a lot quicker than that. Um, so that's the best way to get a hold of us. If they did want to get a hold of us via telephone or chat, it is better to try later in the day and also later in the week. And so that's all the announcements I was going to make. So Secretary. Thank okay. you. Everybody. Thank you so much for the information, okay. Susan. 
We're now entering the Q&A portion of today's call. If you have any questions for either Secretary Alexiak or Susan, please submit them using the chat icon feature in the lower right-hand side of your screen. Please be sure to include your name along with your media outlet. We start today with Michaela Draypack from ABC 27. Just to confirm, if someone has not received their PEUC or pool benefits before December 26, they would be paid retroactively, correct? And what should they do to make sure that that happens? So as long as someone's been filing for their benefits, um, then there would be no issue if, if we're holding on to benefits because we're coming up with a solution, let's say that uh, it, they may not seem eligible or we, there's something we have to look into, you know, while we're working on that, uh, you know, that doesn't affect anything. All claimants, regardless of whether they're eligible or, or ineligible or if they don't know, um, if they're seeking benefits, they should be filing for those weekly or biweekly, depending on which program they're on. Uh, they should be filing for those weekly or biweekly benefits. Um, and then that, of course, is every time someone files for a benefit and it's being held for some reason, that's a work item for us. So as soon as the work item is uh, figured out and we make a decision, then the payments will be, end up being made. Next, we have Lauren Rosenblatt from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. On average, how much money have people received in overpayments? And how many claimants who were receiving PUA are now being determined ineligible? I don't have stats offhand, so that would be one you should uh, send to us and we'll see what we have. I don't think we have a total number of overpayments, but we can see what we have and, and get that out. Altoona Mayor's If I could, Teresa, as far sure. as the, uh, I think the second part of that question about uh, the, um, could you repeat it again? There was another part. Absolutely. Uh, the second part of that one was, how many claimants who were receiving PUA are now being determined ineligible? Again, we don't have an exact number, but I I know from the work that IDME has done, and Susan, you can jump in here if you uh, have any updates, but about 12% uh, of the um, claimants that go through the IDME process have been found to be valid claims. So that's a, a significant percentage in the 80s that uh, a percentage of folks who uh, either have been deemed fraudulent or have not followed through the process yet. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a significant number that uh, are being uh, withheld because they either have been determined to be fraudulent or they have not followed through with the process. Okay, and this next question um, is also in reference to IDME statistics. It's Bill Kibler from Altoona Mirror. How many people received pool benefits prior to hiring IDME? And would you expect that 85 to 90% of those claims are fraudulent, matching the percentage since IDME came on board? Uh, Susan, again, you can speak to this, but um, I would not suspect that they are that high. We have we saw a, a significant increase uh, in uh, um, pool applications, and that's what caused us to stop payments for a while and then bring on uh, IDME. Um, we do have our own internal investigation. We have caught uh, some of the bad guys who do this, working with uh, the agencies that we uh, have worked with, state, local, and federal authorities. So uh, again, it's an ongoing investigation. We we don't I don't have statistics that I can share, but I would be very surprised if it was that high before this latest round of uh, fraudulent attempts. Next, we have Joe Chevalier from the Bucks County Courier Times. How many PUA claimants are there approximately, and what percentage are they of overall UC claims in Pennsylvania? Well, we have um, the number of initial applications, which you can correlate with with number of claimants on that program because it doesn't um, it doesn't allow duplicate claims generally. Uh, so there is, I think, by now about 2.2 million PUA claims that we have. Um, you can check that information on our website. I believe we do post claims information for PUA on its uh, the COVID-19 stats page. Um, so we have 2.2 million total. And what was the other part of it? I'm sorry, Teresa. No, no problem at all. <laughs> We're making part, you really work today. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, the second part is, and what percentage are they of overall UC claims in Pennsylvania? 
Um, well, the UC claims number, I think, is very similar. So it's probably about half um, when we look at the initial initial unemployment claims filed. Um, that's also available on the website. Um, and, you know, off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact number, but it, it was over two million uh, as of a couple months ago. So uh, claims have been trickling in a little bit slower now. Um, so about, you know, about half of our workload is from PUA and, and the other half regular UC and other programs. Next, we have NBC10's Lauren Mayuk. When is the latest payment people will get from the ben get from the benefits from the CARES Act? And how many people in Pennsylvania are currently receiving benefits that will expire because of the end of the CARES Act? So the last payment, uh, I should say the last payable week of any CARES Act program is the week ending December 26th. So that would be the PEUC program and the PUA program, which are expiring. Of course, the FPUC $600 program that expired back in July. Um, so those are the two that will be ending now. So individuals can only be paid through week ending December 26. Um, I don't have a total. I know that uh, we did have some estimates we were working on of how many people will be affected when the, the program ends. Uh, we know a lot of people on PUA have already expired the total amount of benefits available to them, um, but there are some individuals who are continuing to file even now and they have a little bit of benefits available to them. Uh, so we can, you know, we'll keep uh, working on those numbers. Uh, it's difficult because there's there's multiple systems involved and, uh, you know, trying to, to kind of estimate how many people are going to file, how many aren't going to file, how many are going to exhaust, how many aren't. Um, so we have been working on that and we may be able to get something soon. Next, we have Joe Napsha from the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, and he's asking for a clarification to an earlier statistic. His question is, are there 11,000 people who received overpayments or 11,000 claims that might include people overpaid twice or more? The 11,000 was specifically individuals that we found so far who filed a PUA claim but have and, and were getting paid. Um, but who have not, it, it turns out they were not separated from their employment due to a COVID reason. So that was very specifically for that reason. Um, there are other, you know, a multitude of reasons for overpayments, uh, but that uh, specific reason is one that we have been able to tackle more recently uh, now that, you know, we have the additional staff to help. Uh, and of course, we can start going through and um, you know, looking at those on an individual basis where there's a question about someone's eligibility and, uh, you know, whether or not they were truly separated due to a COVID reason or due to some other reason, and maybe they feel they're affected by COVID. Uh, but again, the CARES Act very specifically spells out the reasons why someone can be eligible for PUA. And if it's not listed as one of those reasons, then an individual can't be eligible for PUA. Kristen Hetrick from the Philadelphia Inquirer asks, what are the latest average wait times for workers getting in touch with the unemployment office via phone, email, or chatbot? And how has that changed since the peak of claims in the spring? So for email, um, that is right now, the as I mentioned, the oldest email is from uh, November 4th. So that's you know a little, little less than four weeks ago. Um, on average, it's about two weeks or so for a reply. Um, of course, that's just an average. We have, you know, the oldest being November 4th. And some people, when they email us, receive a response same day. Uh, so anywhere, you know, in between is where individuals may fall. Um, so that one is, is approximately 10 days or so, 10 business days. Um, when it comes to chat, um, I know the, the wait time is never over five minutes. The, the wait time is actually capped. Uh, in a way, but of course, it's a matter of of getting into chat. And I know the chat bot was expanded to receive a lot of inquiries. Um, so she, her name is Paula. Uh, the chat bot is taking care of a lot of basic information. And then individuals, if they are chatting during the hours of uh, um, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, and Paula is not able to answer their question, then they're able to get transferred to an actual uh, human behind the chat and that person can help them with their claim. Um, and when it comes to phones, it's it's kind of the same. I see uh, wait times each day around 40 minutes or so. Once a person gets in, of course, the challenge is always, you know, that we hear from people that they're trying to get into queue and they can't get into queue. 
So, um, you know, those are the, the three ways to, to try to get us. We always mention how telephone and chat are best later in the week and later in the day. Um, those are the best times definitely for those, those um, mediums. And that way, a person doesn't have to try, you know, calling us over and over and over again like they would try on a Monday morning, which is definitely our busiest day of the week. Um, the best way, in my opinion, is always email because then you don't have to spend your time redialing and redialing or trying to get into chat. Um, if you just you know, send us one email, that gets your place in line and email responses are fairly quick right now. So that will uh, get them information much more quickly with, with less um, you know, hassle on their part having to try to, to recall. Um, so you know, those, those are the best ways to get, rid, uh, get a hold of us um, you know, for anyone who's seeking information about their claim. And I'd also like to point out our website has a bunch of great information that is very helpful, um, just like the, the chat bot. And she gives a lot of the same information. Um, it's general information, which really can help people with their claims. They, they may think they have to talk to someone about their claim, but they may not realize, for example, that they had to file claims every week to get payments. So if they read the, the through the website and they might see something basic like that, that they didn't realize about the program, um, then that could help them tremendously. And uh, Susan, I think uh, there was a second part of that question. How does that um, three week to a month uh, um, wait time now for emails uh, re equate to uh, what it was like initially? I want to say it was it was close to three months at one point, but you, you may know better than me. It was. It was getting up there uh, around that that period of time. I remember we um, you know, it was a, a period of time where, of course, we hadn't had new stuff quite onboarded yet. And there were still a ton of claims coming through, so it was just kind of growing. But but now it's quite the opposite. Uh, we've caught up quite a bit. We're less than a month from our oldest one, um, so it is a great way to reach us now. Thank you. And it looks like we're now entering our second round of questions. So I encourage any reporters who have any additional follow-ups at this time that have not been answered to please submit them now. Next, we have Michaela Draypack from ABC 27, and she wants to know, now, does everyone have to go through the IDME process, including PUA, PEUC, and regular unemployment benefit recipients or claimants? Excuse me. Uh, no, the IDME verification is currently just for PUA claimants, and it's only for those that we feel need the extra verification. Uh, there are out of out of all of our claimants, about a third of them get sent to IDME, so it's not 100%. Uh, now, when it comes to brand new claims, we don't have a lot of brand new claims every day right now, maybe 1,000 to 2,000. We are sending all of those to IDME for, for PUA brand new claims, um, but it's an extremely small amount. Um, you know, when you're looking at the overall picture and how many claims out of those 2.2 million we've sent, it really is just a third of them. So uh, when the secretary mentioned that about 12% have verified, it's 12% of that third that we've been sending. Next, Joe Chevalier from Bucks County Courier Times. How many number wise are the 3% of unemployment compensation claims still unresolved that Ernst and Young are still reviewing? And how has that total backlog changed since November 1st? Uh, the number is uh, about 47,000, I believe. Uh, Susan, I don't know if you have that handy, but uh, I know at one point it was about 54,000. So it has uh, gone down significantly and uh, continues to go down. And what also, as we've said before, is the the weeks covered by that 97% uh, figure have uh, have gotten closer together. So that window is, is uh, tighter. So we are making uh, significant progress with that. We have another follow-up from Michaela Draypack from ABC 27. How many phone calls and emails are you responding to daily now? And how were you able to increase to 8,000 calls daily and 11,000 emails by the end of the year? I know the, uh, Susan, you may have an exact number, but uh, the, the reason we know we're going to be increasing is because we are uh, continuing to see those numbers head in the right direction. Uh, and that's where we anticipate they will be, uh, given the uh, trends that we're seeing, the extra people we're bringing on, uh, the um, claims at this point leveling off, they may increase. We'll see where, where that will go as, as the COVID numbers uh, spike up. But um, uh, I don't know, uh, Susan, do you have a number on the calls? 
I think we do have that. Yes, uh, I'm looking real quick. So let's say uh, it, it's around an average of 6,000 calls that we take each day through the, the regular line. This is not the pool line. Uh, about 6,000 calls that we handle daily. Um, when it comes to emails, um, we've sent anywhere uh, in the past two weeks or so. Um, some days we've we've been able to send 14,000 um, down to a low of about 10,000. So uh, we're we're able to you know get on it a lot faster, especially since we have all the extra help now from uh, the vendors that that we've been working with and individuals from other agencies. Um, you know that's helped tremendously. So we're able to get through a lot more. Um, and even once we first brought them on, you know, it, it's a little bit of a learning curve to figure out what's going on in unemployment and figure out, you know, when someone asks you a question, where to find the answer and, and how to view the claim correctly to find any issues. So, uh, you know, we've definitely seen that that, that learning curve has uh, been passed and they're able to output a lot more emails and answer more phones uh, than they were prior. Altoona Mayor's Bill Kibler asks, so pool claims initiated before IDME came on board are being assessed by IDME now, correct? Yes. So what, uh, I'll try to give a quick synopsis. So as we were going along with the program, there are, we've always, well, I shouldn't say always, since toward the beginning of the program, uh, we have had fraud measures in place. If you remember, we started talking about them back in June, um, how we, you know, we're trying to find fraud, working with our, our other states and other partners, um, you know, coming up with ideas on ways to find fraud. So we've been doing that since June. So a lot of the claims that we're sending through now are ones that we have have had um, noted since June need to be checked. Uh, a lot of them we were able to take care of manually, um, but of course the whole reason to get IDME on board was because it really was a high volume for the amount of manual help that we have. So uh, IDME was then able to take care of anyone that we didn't take care of manually. So that's what that third of claims represents is going back throughout you know, our, our history of PUA and uh, getting those verified, which we had held for whatever reason, uh, to see if they really are who they say they are. And an additional follow-up question, Susan, in reference to overpayments. How many or what percentage of PUA claims were found to be overpaid because they were unemployed, not as a result of COVID, but for a different reason? Uh, that, that would be the 11,000 that I mentioned uh, so far. Of course, we're we're going to keep finding uh, as we go along. We'll probably find other individuals who may not be unemployed for the the COVID reasons that they need to be unemployed for. So as of now, there's been over eleven thousand individuals that we found overpaid because they were not unemployed due specifically to one of the COVID reasons in the CARES Act. Um, so we'll we'll you know keep plugging away at it, and as issues are raised, um, you know, sometimes they're, it's through something that they self-reported and it kind of raises a question, or we may be reviewing something else and, and we see that the, the dates don't match up. Like if they said they were laid off sometime in 2019, that, that doesn't make sense because COVID didn't start in 2020, things like that. So um, as we look through them, we'll find more um, and, you know, issue overpayments as, as needed. Of course, no overpayment is ever just issued. There's a fact-finding process that happens first where we speak with the person, get the information, we speak with other parties, we do our full fact-finding and give everyone due process. Um, and then if we find that they are ineligible, then we issue the overpayment. Thank you, Susan. Before we wrap up today, do either you or Secretary Alexiak have any additional comments for our reporters? Uh, thank you, Teresa. I, I do have <clears throat> uh, a moment I'd like to take to uh, uh, remind everyone, as we announced a few weeks ago, that I will be retiring as of December 4th. So Friday is my last day with the Commonwealth. And uh, I just wanted to uh, thank all of you who have been a part of this for many, many, many months. Uh, I do appreciate your work. I appreciate the role you play in the system, uh, the accountability that you make sure we have. And uh, I, I just want to thank you for being a part of it. And I also want to thank Susan and the uh, comm staff for being a part of this as well. I especially want to thank, as I have uh, internally, the uh, 5,000 or so employees at Labor and Industry who have worked so hard uh, since in the three plus years that I've been here, but particularly in the past eight months, nine months, 10 months, close to 
that we have been um, working our way through this unprecedented uh, historic uh, time that we have been working through. So I uh, appreciate uh, the efforts of everyone involved. Again, thank you for being a part of it. And you will be in good hands, uh, Deputy Secretary Jennifer Burrier, who is currently the Deputy Secretary for Safety and, Safety and Labor Management Relations, will be uh, uh, working these calls uh, starting next week. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much for this comment, Secretary Alexiak. And that's all the time we have for today. Please email our communications office at dlipress at pa.gov with any additional questions. Thank you so much for joining us today and stay well. Thank you.